Um, if you do have questions for the pair, please um, uh, fire them through the Mentimeter app. Uh, we're taking questions there across there as well. Our next presenters joining us here are Dr. Helen Paulson and uh, Dr. Karen Oldfield. Uh, we're talking hemp for medicine still. Uh, Dr. Helen Paulson works in the toxicology section of ESR based in Wellington with over 20 years of experience in analysis of drugs and poisons in biological specimens and their involvement in accidental or unexpected sudden death, plus a whole host of experience uh, for many years in various elements of cannabis and hemp. Um, Dr. Karen Oldfield is a medical research fellow at the Medical Research Institute of New Zealand, uh, a, general, a GP who has now moved into clinical research and has an interest in medical cannabis and its therapeutic potential. Uh, just recently commenced a PhD through Victoria University looking at the clinical use of cannabinoids in New Zealand. Round of applause, ladies and gents, for our two presenters here in this session. Right, good afternoon. I've had a very long association with cannabis. It began on the day I started work, not before. Back in the days of DSIR, I worked in the illicit drugs group, analysing plant you know, powders, pills for the police. After every rock concert, we were inundated with cannabis cigarette butts to analyse. Now, I've sta I started analysing cannabis plant to um, determine its potency. Now, this was before the hydroponic growing started. Plant grown out in the bush had very variable potency. 1994 to 96, female flowering heads from police seizures ranged from 0.2 to 8.8%. Some people clearly didn't know what they were growing or smoking. I did get to analyse some very nice hydroponically grown female heads, just once, 30%, lovely stuff. Um, when, well it was, it smelled beautiful. When, hemp, when the hemp growing uh, started in the late 1990s, plant samples were sent to ESR to ensure it was below the required limit. All the seeds at that point were imported, and again, results were variable. Now, when I moved from illicit drugs to toxicology, I was still analysing cannabis, but now it was THC and blood samples taken mainly from deceased people. THC and uh, blood levels are very low. You know, recent smoking is 10 micrograms per litre. And getting THC out of biological samples involves a laborious extraction process and special equipment to detect the low levels. Uh, cannabis use has become more accepted over the years. I noticed a distinct increase when Nandor Tanchos was in Parliament. But I just wish they wouldn't drive while under the influence. Last year, our lab analysed 230 deceased driver blood samples. 26% had used alcohol, 34% had used cannabis. Many of them had used both. This is the first year I've had more deceased drivers using cannabis than alcohol. Now, it's currently the um, sale of food containing hemp seeds is not allowed. It was sometime in the 1990s our food standards was linked to Australia, and they banned the use of the hemp seeds as food products. The product most likely to contain the most THC is the hemp seed oil, which must contain no more than 10 milligrams per kilogram. Now, bioavailability of THC through the gut, that is through the digestive system, is very poor. And I worked out once that you'd need to drink about five litres of hemp seed oil in one go to get enough THC into the bloodstream to get high. I don't think anyone's going to do that. Now, if food was going to be allowed to contain hemp seeds, there was a concern that eating these foods would give a positive reaction on the roadside oral fluid testing devices. They do a lot of roadside testing in Australia. Now, there have been um, studies of oral fluid levels after smoking cannabis and eating cannabis cookies made with the high-potency cannabis, and it was easy enough to calculate that eating hemp-based foods was not going to be a problem, but they still need to prove that for court purposes. So there was a study in Australia recently with THC spiked into oil that proved you would not get a positive reaction on these roadside devices. So we've come back full circle to cannabis as a medicine. You now the cannabis in this mixture would be um, one of the more minor ingredients. Chloral hydrate, it's a sedative, morphine, good painkiller. Hydrocyanic acid, that's cyanide. No, no wonder it cured so many ailments, anything from diarrhoea, asthma, spasms, hysteria. Now, testing requirements for medicines nowadays is a little more rigorous. Any benefits claimed have to be proved. There are a lot of regulations involved when producing a medicine. These are on top of the regulations when dealing with controlled drugs, as we've heard about this morning. 
and rightly so. You know, with a medicine, you need to be able to expect a consistent product. This may not be so simple when you're down, um, dealing with plant-based product. So the misuse of um, drugs amendment currently going through Parliament is expected to map out the regulatory and testing framework for medicinal cannabis products. We're expecting the testing in New Zealand to be consistent with the Australian regulations as defined in the Therapeutic Goods uh, Good Order 93. And we also expect the products will be required to be made and tested in a GMP compliant facility. Therapeutics Good Order 93 outlines testing requirements for medicinal cannabis. You have to prove that the plant you're dealing with is actually a cannabis plant and includes no foreign material. All active ingredients must be declared and all active ingredients have to come from the plant. More pretty. Nice pictures, these ones. Um, the main active ingredient of the, uh, the, of course, the cannabinoids, THC, CBD, CBG, CBN. There are dozens of other minor cannabinoids. The proportions are going to depend on the plant. So if THC is not considered an active ingredient in your product, the product is not allowed to contain more than 1% THC. So any medicine needs to be labelled with the stated content of all active ingredients. And when tested, the amount of the active ingredient must fall within a specified range, depending on the dose form. If you're providing a, um, a herbal dose form, the allowed variation is 20% of the stated dose. If the dose is capsules or tablets or liquid extracts, the variation is only about 10% 10, 10 of the stated dose. And then, because you're dealing with a plant-based product, there are other components to consider. Are the terpenes considered active components? Which ones? Yeah, there are a lot of them. Other components have to be tested as well. Heavy metals for arsenic, cadmium, lead, mercury, pesticide residues, solvent residues, and microbial activity. You know, you're starting with a plant, mold could occur at some stage, and some of the compounds produced by mold can be, can be carcinogenic. So at ESR, we've got methods for analyzing the cannabinoids in plants, extracts and oils, to determine the levels of the main cannabinoids. We routinely uh, analyze blood for THC, and we're working on methods to detect the full range of the cannabinoids in blood and urine and oral fluid. Now, all laboratory testing for medicinal products must follow good manufacturing processes. Our pharmaceutical group is GMP certified, and we've just taken delivery of a new machine which will G be GMP certified. So the ESR is building the capability to, to cover the testing requirements within a GMP compliant facility. But on top of all this chemical testing, there could be another consideration, the stability of the product. What are the storage conditions required both before and after manufacture, before and after sale? What's the shelf life going to be? So our ESR pharmaceutical group already does this type of testing for other medicines for the Ministry of Health. Now, consistency of product is essential to get any meaningful data from clinical trials, which Dr. Oldfield is going to tell you about. Just on time. How about that? Oh, sorry, one more. So my name's Karen Oldfield. I'm a medical research fellow at the Medical Research Institute of New Zealand, which is an independent research organisation based out of Wellington Hospital. And I'm going to talk about um, taking a GMP product to a prescribed medication, so basically the clinical trials process and so this is sort of a generic thing, it's not based around specifically um, medicinal cannabis. <clears throat> so why do we need clinical trials? Well basically we want to provide evidence that medications are both safe and tolerable for those people using them. So that's investigating how the body processes a medication and what effect the body on the body that this has. So basically the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the medication that people are taking. The other thing we want to do is to investigate whether or not the product is effective in specific medical conditions. So basically giving evidence for use of the product, so backing up or refusing claims that are made about it. So basically what it says on the label is what it actually does. And this allows doctors and patients to have informed discussions about the medication that they are recommending or prescribing or that the patient has come in to discuss with them. So here's a quick overview of the clinical trials process. As you can see, it's quite a long process. And um, I'm basically going to go through most of these in the next few slides. So before the trial starts, you've got your um, GMP 
product that you want to test, you need to come up with a study protocol and design. And as part of that, you would do something called a SCOT application, and so that's to the Standing Committee on Therapeutic Trials. Because under Section 30 of the Medicines Act, an approval is required from the Director General of Health um, prior to uh, testing any new medication in New Zealand. Um, it's run by MedSafe, and then a committee from the Health Research Council will review and make recommendations on the ability to take a trial with that medication. The other thing that will be done is once um, you've got the protocol and the SCOT application, you'll also make an application to the Health and Disability Ethics Committee. That's about 83 pages of application that's required because ethics approvals are required for all clinical trials. And their primary role is to safeguard the rights, health and well-being of consumers and research participants by undertaking an independent ethical review of proposed research. And that's making sure that the study is undertaken in accordance with the Code of Health and Disability Services Consumer Rights and the Privacy Act of 1993. So we've managed to do all of that, so what's sort of the next step when it comes to clinical trials? Well, the first one is a phase one clinical trial. So it's the first step, so these are first in human. And these are basically the ones that are used to determine the pharmacokinetics, safety, and tolerability of the medication. And it will also be used to determine what an appropriate dosage would be used for um, future trials. So whether or not you take it once a day, twice a day, as often as you want to. So these are generally small trials with healthy volunteers. In later phase one trials, you can also have small amounts of people with a specific medical condition that you're interested in. And but people will come in and they will have a whole lot of baseline tests done. So things like their heart rate, their, um, their blood pressure, they'll have blood tests, then they'll be dosed with the medication and then all those tests will be repeated over certain numbers of times depending on how long you're testing it over. And these um, phase one clinical trials generally are undertaken over months. After that, you move on to a phase two clinical trial. So these are larger. They're generally tens to hundreds of participants. Participants in these trials will have a specific medical condition that's being targeted by the medication. Um, the gold standard is a double-blind randomized control trial, and that's where both the participant and the investigator um, don't know what treatment is being given. And these trials are looking at the efficacy of the medication to see if there's an indication to move on to the larger randomized control trials. And these do take, again, months to years. Then you move on to the phase three clinical trials. These are the big ones. So they've got hundreds of thousands of participants with specific diseases or conditions. And again, they're looking at the efficacy of the medication over a longer period of time and examining any adverse effects that may, be, um, may occur with medication. And they usually take years. And then you have your phase four clinical trials, and so these ones happen after a drug has been marketed, so they're post-surveillance trials. Um, so they're looking at people, real-life patients who are using the medication day to day, um, and they're looking at the longer-term efficacy and side effects, um, as well as potential drug interactions that may not have been realised in the earlier um, clinical trials, and also in populations that may have not been studied in those first phase one to three trials. So, you've completed your clinical trials, what next? Well, in New Zealand, once medications have undergone the clinical trials process, then an application to MedSafe can be made um, to have it approved for use. And so MedSafe would require data supporting the quality, efficacy, and safety of the proposed medication. Another thing that would happen is that findings from the clinical trials will be um, published in peer-reviewed journals to allow healthcare professionals to access the information so that they can have informed discussions with their patients. Another thing that could also happen is that a submission could be made to Pharmac for consideration of the medication to be funded so that people can get it sort of on a $5 script or partially funded so they're not having to pay the full amount. Um, and so part of that application process would be findings from the clinical trials. So pretty much, as you can see, it's quite a long process. It does take, as I said, years to go through, but it's an important process so that and myself as a healthcare professional could have a conversation with someone to say that yes, this medication is indicated in your condition and we can actually sort of sit down and have a really good discussion about that. And look, we're that early, one minute and 35 seconds. Yeah. <laughs>